اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I start in the name of Allah, the beneficent and the merciful. I seek salvation from shaitan, the accursed. My dearest viewers, my brothers and sisters from all across the world, Assalamu alaikum, jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the blessings and the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you at all times. I would like to thank you once again for tuning in to the Ramadan show exclusively here on Imam Hussein TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Insha'Allah, we hope and we pray we can be of service to you to be your one-stop shop for this holy month. I would like to once again ask you to send in your pictures, your videos, your blogs about where you are from and about how you prepare for this holy month. I would also like to ask you to join us on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube and on Instagram. Before commencing on to the show, I would like to start off with a hadith, a saying from Amir al-Mu'mineen salam where he says, the blindness of the eye is better than the blindness of the mind. In this, Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying, physical blindness is better than ignorance. Ignorance is the root of one's downfall. Ignorance is the root of one's distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this holy month, let's try and achieve some elevation, not only spiritually, but we should try and increase our knowledge during this holy month as well. In this episode, as we talk about spiritual refinement, I want to talk about that one trait that is encouraged by all of the ayam of the Tahirin and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself. It is said in the Quran, and if you pardon and forbear and forgive, then surely Allah is forgiving and merciful. This trait is forgiveness. There are three main stages of forgiveness, and inshallah, we'll go through each of these in turn, which are mentioned in this verse. To really forgive a person, you must go through all three of these stages. The first of the stages is pardoning, which means overlooking the wronged or the wrong person or the person who's wronged you in any way whatsoever. According to Amir al-Mu'mineen pardon is the crown of all noble qualities. Pardoning could include making excuses for the person, giving them another chance, understanding their weaknesses, not taking it too seriously and not focusing on it continuously. Going through the stage speeds up the process of genuine forgiveness. The second stage is forbearance. By this I mean to refrain from reproaching through words and actions. Sometimes we forgive but cannot resist the temptation to speak about it and remind the other person of the hurt they inflicted. Words, gestures, even feelings are a constant reminder of the hurt that we have forgiven but cannot get over. True forgiveness entails complete forbearance. If we went through the first stage conscientiously, the second would be easy. The Holy Quran says, so overlook with a gracious forbearance. Imam Rida in explaining the word saf in this verse says it means to pardon and forgive someone without punishment, harshness or reproach. The third and final part is actually forgiveness. Forgiveness means erasing the deed that has been done and removing any negative consequences from the deed or from what it warrants. When Allah forgives a deed, He will not punish the doer for it. It is removed from the book of deeds. Forgiving someone means that no thought of retaliation or revenge remains. It means that the slate is clean and that we're starting over again. It's as though the crime was never committed in the first place. There are some points to ponder over at this stage. Something for us to think about, especially in this holy month. When we come across people who we think have wronged us, 
whether rightly or wrongly, we sometimes hold a grudge. We sometimes think about it constantly. Sometimes we even want revenge. These are all things that are discouraged amongst the Aymat al-Tahirin. If someone is genuinely sorry for what they've done, forgive them. Give them another chance. And inshallah, the way you've forgiven that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely forgive you. Forgiveness is very powerful. If we don't forgive, the past wounds can ruin. They can also infect the future. The Holy Prophet says, pardon each other. Hatred between yourselves will be eliminated. Love includes being able to forgive mistakes. Allah loves his creatures and has kept the doors of repentance and forgiveness open at all times. Without that, human beings would be doomed. In the same way, love for family and friends means that we should be ready and we should forgive easily. Only then can we live in harmony and peace with them. Learn to forgive genuinely. The process described in this verse is a cleansing process that will leave you happier and better adjusted. Taking that step will also open the doors of elevation towards God and towards other people. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, has said, whoever pardons a wrong, Allah will replace it for him with honor in this world and in the hereafter. On these holy nights, let's pray that our hearts become softer, soft enough so that we can forgive each other. Through continuous sinning, our hearts may be hard and it may be difficult for us to forgive other people for whatever they've done to us. This is a cleansing process. This month is a cleansing month where our spirits elevate, our souls appreciate towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this month, let's try and soften our hearts through repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once our hearts are soft, we'll be able to forgive the people around us. We'll develop connections, affections, and insha'Allah, by forgiving other people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will in turn also forgive us. Imam al-Sadiq, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, If the month of Ramadan remains safe and sound with respect to sins, then the entire year shall also remain so. The month of Ramadan is the beginning of the year. In today's episode, as we travel around the world and we look at people from different walks of life, I want to look at the country of Tunisia and inshallah I'll go through and tell you about how they spend this month of Ramadan. Because Tunisia is predominantly a Muslim country, with a Muslim government the working hours are altered. The people in Tunisia, they work either early mornings and to early afternoon or they work until 3 p.m. depending on where they are. So usually it's 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. or 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. After which they go home for rest and they get ready for the evening. The iftar itself consists of some healthy food, initially very light food, such as olives, soups, dates. And then after that, the people tend to go to the parks, to the fun fairs, and enjoy the night. After a few hours, they come home and they have the main meal. And because the Tunisian diet is the Mediterranean diet, it's usually very healthy. So they have things like roast chicken, fresh fish. And then the people stay up until the time of suhoor. And at the time of suhoor, they have something very light, such as yogurt, cheese, olives, after which people go to sleep. As I've mentioned, during the main nights, or during most of the nights of the month of Ramadan, People go to the park, however, in the last 10 nights, when it's the time for A'mal, they go to the mosques and they recite the A'mal, their du'a, their prayers, and they fulfill the obligations, as is, is the norm with the Shia community. 
Inshallah, I would like to ask you to send in your videos, your clips, your pictures, your blogs about where you are from to show us how you prepare for this holy month. As I've said before, and I'll say it again, it is very interesting to see and get an insight into your lives and to see how you prepare yourselves and how it is different from other people from around the world. It is amazing to see how everyone, despite their different cultural traditions, come together and they come together to serve one Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dearest Imam Hussein TV viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Imam Hussein TV 3. Today we came to one of the stores in the holy city of Karbala to report to you the atmosphere of the holy month of Ramadan in the holy city of Karbala. <laughs> Dearest viewers, let's have a word with one of the brothers here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Mungkin tetfadhalin an al-ajwa' ab Madinat Karbala khilal shahar Ramadan al-Mubarak? Shahar Ramadan huwa shahar al-Rahman. Subhanallah, shahar hada fil shi ajib gharib. Yikhtilif an baqiyat kulli shuhur. Subhanallah, wa huwa shahar Allah. Shahar Ramadan, khasatan bjuar al-Imam al-Hussein salamallah alayhi wa khayyabu al-Fadl al-Abbas, yitmiyaz ibtabi' jiddan jameel. اللي هو التواصل الزوار ووفود هل هل المدينة المقدسة هذه وعدم انقطاعها يعني هي تا كان بشهر رمضان أو بغيره بس بشهر رمضان إنها فت خاصية المدينة المكرمة هذه بشهر رمضان لأنه أغلب الناس بهالفترة هذه يعني يعتبر اللي بيهم ما أخذ إجازة مثلا من عمله أو شيء بشهر رمضان وغيره وبالإضافة للحلقات القرآنية اللي موجودة والمحاضرات اللي باستمرار موجودة بالإمام الحسين سلام الله عليه تكون فد حافز أو دافع أو الأجواء الروحانية اللي موجودة بالإمام الحسين وخيب الفضل العباس فتكون فد طابع مميز لهاي المدينة يختلف عن بقية المحافظات. I ask the brother about the holy month of Ramadan here in the holy city of Karbala and he's saying that the holy month of Ramadan is so special due to the uh, uh, spirituality that this month had. Uh, the holy city of Karbala, of course, is different in the holy month of Ramadan, and the visitors uh, feel like more connected with, the, with, with this city and with the holy shrine of Imam al-Hussein and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas uh, The brother is saying that the visitors uh, usually uh, have uh, holidays during the holy month of Ramadan from their work, so they come to the holy city of Karbala more and more, and uh, they participate in the majalis and the Quranic uh, recitation in the holy city of Karbala inside the holy, uh, the holy shrine of Imam al Hussein and his brother Abu al Fadl al Abbas. Now, can you tell us about your work in the month of Ramadan? Is it different from the rest of the month or the routine? In terms of your work in the month of Ramadan, it is not different from the rest of the month of Ramadan. بحكم عملنا إحنا جملة يعني معتمدين على المحلات اللي موجودة مو على الزبائن الأهل المفرد يعني فيكون عملنا تقريبا هم شبه متواصل بس بعض المحلات يعني هم صعب بعدهم شغلة يفتح الصبح أو غيره يبقى كل أغلبية عملنا يكون مكثف ورا الفطور يعني قبل الفطور أكو عمل بس مو بالنفس الكثافة اللي تكون بعد الفطور I asked the brother about their working hours during the holy month of Ramadan and he's saying that uh, usually their hours uh, are not much different from other months of the year uh, due to their specific job that they are doing here as they, they supply the other stores with cell phones. Uh, therefore, they, uh, they, uh, they usually work uh, the normal uh, day hour and beside that, uh, they try to be here after the iftar for the other stores that cannot open during the day to come here and do their shopping.
Inshallah, in today's medical tips and health advice, we'll be continuing our theme of exploring the beauty of the human body. We've talked about the ailments, the diseases and the illnesses. And now we talk about Allah's beauty, His mercy, His infinite blessings and His miracles in that we as the human beings are the perfect animals. And in the human body, there's no system which is more perfect than the nervous system, the brain. Scientists have explored the whole planet. They've tried to make their own things. And no creation is greater than the human brain. And one thing in the human brain which surpasses all other creatures is the ability of the human to rationalize things, to think things through and to act based on rational thinking. Inshallah, today we will talk about the spinal cord of the spinal column and the peripheral nervous system. Yesterday we talked about the brain and the special senses. And we talked about why the brain and the special senses are so specialized at what they do and they make the human being complete. The spinal column consists of a few things. There is the spinal column itself and the spinal cord and it's surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid. This fluid allows it to be intact and allows everything to happen the way it does. The CSF is actually a rehydrator and the fluid circulates through the brain or through the spinal column and around the brain as well. The spinal column itself consists of grey matter and white matter. It consists of many nerve fibres that run up towards the brain and many nerve fibres that run down from the brain towards the peripheral nervous system. The spinal column also is made in such a way that different parts of the spinal column supply different parts of the body. And it's related and it's linked based on whereabouts it is and embryo embryological development. Such as the thoracic nervous system, thoracic nerves which are formed in the chest area are actually supplying things like the arm and the chest wall. Whereas the lumbar, lumbar and sacral regions lower down in the spinal column supply the legs and the thighs and the lower abdomen. And therefore we find that the nerves have developed as the human being has developed in the womb embryologically. The peripheral nervous system is specialized in that it contains many fibers, fibers that leave the spinal column and head out to the rest of the body and nerves that head, out, head in from the rest of the body into the spinal column. The nerves that head out tend to be motor nerves, nerves that control muscle contraction for example and the nerves that come in tend to be sensory nerves, different types of sensory nerves taking different types of sensations. So for example, the sensory nerves for heat and for vibration taking that information to the spine. The senses for pain, pain exists in two types. There's a sharp pain and there's the dull pain, so there's C fibers and A delta fibers and they take in the information towards the spinal column. There's many other types of nerves as well such as proprioceptive nerves. These are designed to look at where the joints are in terms of position in space. And therefore the human being, when it's got its eyes closed, if I hold my hands out, I know that my hands are in front of me without actually feeling them. And I know when my fingers are being moved because the specialized nerves in the tips of the joints or in the, on the joints themselves allow the sensation to travel up towards my brain and for my brain to realize that the, that the finger and the joints have actually moved and which position they're in. Similarly, there are other nerves which supply or come from the peripheral nervous system and head centrally up towards the brain where they get processed in the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe as we explained yesterday and then that, goes, that gets fed into the frontal lobe where we get to plan our next action based on the sensation of everything around us. There's some more nerve fibers found in the peripheral nervous system. The motor fibers which come from the nerves or from the spinal column head out towards the muscles and then they supply mus individual muscle areas. And when the brain is thinking or when the brain wants the, to contract the muscles, these nerves are initiated or engaged and they cause muscle contraction. Similarly, there are other nerves which act upon the other parts of the body. I'm going to go on to the autonomic nervous system in a bit, but I just want to talk something about reflexes. I'm sure that when you go to see your general practitioner, he, sometimes if you, study, if you have certain problems, they test your nerves. For example, the knee, the patella reflex, they put a tendon hammer and they tap the knee, and then the foot somehow just extends and then goes back. Some of you might be wondering how that happens. 
The reason is that there's actually a reflex arc that's formed by the way that the nerves, nervous system works. So apart from the system where you feel a sensation, it travels all the way up to the brain, you process it, and the brain sends information to the motor cortex, and then you act based on that information that you have, there is also a reflex arc where the peripheral nerve goes straight to the spinal column and a reflex comes straight out from the spinal column straight to the muscle and therefore we find that the response is very quick. What are we looking for when we tap the reflex or when we tap the kneecap? It's actually the patella tendon that we're tapping and what we're looking for is to see what the reflex is. If it's too much of a reflex we worry that there could be a problem with the brain. If it's too little of a reflex we worry that it could be a problem with one of the, one of the peripheral nerves. Now, the way that this reflex arc works is that we tap the tendon and the nerves from the tendon travel up to the spinal column. And the way that we tap it is so specific, it's a fast tap and therefore what happens is you get a reflex straight away to the muscle group that is connected to that tendon. And in this case, it happens to be the quadriceps which are found in the thighs. And as a result, they contract and then they cause the knee as a result to extend upwards. If the brain is damaged for whatever reason, this reflex arc, as well as having a positive mechanism, it has a negative reinforcement from the brain. So even though we have the reflex, the brain actually modifies this to be moderate. Without this modification from the brain, we have hyperreflexia or an over-exaggeration um, over of the reflex. So instead of a very smooth movement, you get a very fast movement. And therefore we call that hyperreflexia and it's concerning because it means there could be a problem with the higher part of the brain. Likewise, if we're not getting enough of a reflex, it means that when the peripheral nerve goes into the spinal column, there's actually a reflex that comes out, it's a normal reflex. However, en route to the muscle, there's actually a breakage. And therefore, either you don't get a re response or you get a diminished response. And again, that is of concern. Now, we've talked about the peripheral nervous system and the nerves that are actually supplying the muscles as well as the nerves that take information back in towards the spinal column. There's one other type of nervous system that I want to talk about very quickly and that is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is controlled by sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves and they're controlled by different factors. So the sympathetic is based on the adrenaline or the adrenergic nerves that are based in the body. Adrenaline, a sudden surge of adrenaline, as I'm sure many of you know, is based on the fight or flight response. So for example, if you're in a situation, in, for example, in an exam, or if you're in a situation where you have a flight or fight response, there are specific things that happen to your body. You sometimes feel your heart pounding away. You feel sweaty. You feel flushed. And that is the reason for that is that the sympathetic nervous system takes over. And as a result, with the sympathetic nervous system, you get a specific response. And the reason why you get that response is because all the blood supply is rushing to your muscles in ready for that fight or flight response. That's why sometimes you feel butterflies in the tummy. It's not because there's actual butterflies in your stomach, but because the blood supply to the stomach is decreased so that the blood supply to other parts of the body, such as your major organs, such as your muscles, is increased. Therefore, you can have a fight or flight response. Similarly, someone who is... Um, is having a sympathetic overdrive will feel palpitations, may feel the blood pressure going up or feeling flushed. This is all part of this nervous system and it's actually moderated by adrenaline or noradrenaline actually which is the nerve, the neurotransmitter that increases the production or increases the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system counteracts the sympathetic nervous system. So it's like a two, two types of nervous systems in, in sort of uh, battle with each other. When the, when the parasympathetic nervous system takes over, then you get the opposite response. The heart rate can drop. You can decrease your sweat output. And obviously, this can, this can be a benefit to the human being or this can be not beneficial, depending on the situation that the human being is in. Normally, human beings have a problem with overproduction of adrenaline or they have a problem with the overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. Often you get people who suffer from ongoing anxiety and that is because their sympathetic nervous system is overstimulated. Like I said, this can be due to many reasons, but if you find you in that situation, the best way to modify what's happening is by doing simplistic things on a day-to-day -day basis, such as cutting down caffeine, such as trying not to be too stressed and modifying the stress factors in your life 
so that you're not stressed all the time. And thirdly, meditating, reflecting, contemplating regularly will allow your heart rate to drop and your blood pressure to drop, will allow your breathing rate to settle down. And that is all to calm you down and reduce the sympathetic drive. As a result, you won't get things like overproduction of sweat, your palpitations, and other such symptoms that you get associated with the sympathetic nervous system. As I've said before, the human body is the perfect model for all of the animals in the world. And the human nervous system is the best system within this human body. So one can argue the human nervous system is probably the most superior type of system in the animal kingdom altogether. It's one of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, arguably one of the greatest miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because no matter how much scientists try to replicate, to copy what this great system does, they're unable to do so. They've been trying for centuries and nothing comes even close to doing or to making what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Therefore, it is so important to look after our bodies, to keep them healthy and to make sure that as a result we have a long quality of life so we can serve our communities, serve our societies and also ultimately serve the awaited Imam alayhi salam. During the time of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, a man came to him and said, I frequently disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cannot prevent myself from sin. For this reason, can you please give me some advice so I can keep myself away from committing sins? Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, said to him, do five things and then commit as much sin as you want. The sinner said, please inform me of those five things. Imam Hussein said, number one, do not eat from the provisions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then do whatever you like. The sinner said, what will I be able to eat? Because whatever in this universe is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Hussein then said, then leave the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then do whatever you like. The sinner said, oh Imam, this is more difficult than the first one. If I leave earth, then where will I go? Every place belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Hussein then said, then find a place where Allah cannot see you and then do whatever you like. The sinner said, but O oh, Imam, nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam then said, then do only one thing. When the angel of death, Azrael, comes to you, keep him away from yourself and do whatever you like. And if you cannot do that, lastly, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends you into hell, do not go into hell. And if you cannot do that, then commit whatever sin you want. The sinner said, that's it, O son of Prophet Muhammad. From today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never find me in a situation which he dislikes. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, in tonight's show, the nasheed I want to recite is actually one that's been written by myself and my brother Abbas. It is actually for the occasion of the birth of Imam al Hussein, but it's something that I wanted to share because, after all, it's the month of Ramadan, and the month of Sha'aban was only a month ago. And the other thing is that Imam al Hussein forms the heartbeat for all the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt and all the Shia around the world. So, inshallah, I hope you can listen to this and take yourself back to the birth of Imam al Hussein. Tonight is the night when a star came to earth. 
Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy birth. Tonight is the night when a star came to earth. Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy birth. The angels have come down on this very night to pay their respects to the brightest of light, upholder of truth and protector of right, who prove righteousness is the meaning of might. He taught us the meaning of love and of peace. Remember your values in what you believe and always be grateful for what you receive. And closeness to Allah is what you'll achieve. Above humans, angels, and jinn is his word. Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy birth. His parents are Zahra and Imam Ali. His grandfather is the Rasul of Adi. Along with Hassan, they are entirely the greatest examples of how we should be. His household is ever so holy and pure. They are the selected who Allah adores. And they are the one whom the heavens are for. For the galaxies, all of them are the core of our pure Aima. Hussein is the third. Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy birth. Tonight is the night when a star came to earth. Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy birth. He has dedicated his life every deed in love of Allah and for humanity. Personification of nobility, of righteousness, of love and of purity. His name with everything good goes hand in hand. To love those who love him is Allah's command. His praises are sung out across every land. His character and status are very grand. His name will be called out by the whole universe. Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy birth. Tonight is the night when a star came to earth. Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy birth. Tonight is the night of Hussein's holy Imam al-Sadiq, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, If the month of Ramadan remains safe and sound with respect to sins, then the entire year shall also remain so. The month of Ramadan is the beginning of the year. As we conclude another episode of the Ramadan show exclusively here on Imam Hussein TV, I would like to leave you with a final thought, something to get you to think, something to reflect over, and that is that expectation is the root of all disappointment. If we have high expectations in life, high expectations that people give us something, high expectations that everything will be ours, it would only end in disappointment because we cannot attain everything in life. We strive, we have ambition, and that's good. But hoping and wanting everything, having the greed of expectation for everything will only lead to disappointment. I would like to once again thank you for tuning in and watching. And inshallah, we hope we've been of some service to you. I would like to once again ask you to please send in your videos, your pictures, your blogs about how you've spent this holy month. And please join the debate on Twitter using the hashtag IHTVRamadan. Before going, I would like to bid you farewell with these following words. Wassalamu alaikum, jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.